Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl podcast, which is all about motivating, inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. The Tough Girl podcast is sponsorship and ad free thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. To find out more about supporting your favorite podcast and becoming a patron, please check out www.patreon.com forward slash Tough Girl podcast. There's currently over 230 patrons who are supporting the mission to help me increase the amount of female role models out there. Take action action now and become one of them. Just want to do a couple of shout outs. A massive thank you to Kat Benger, Damiana Day, who's all the way over in New Zealand, Shauna Fallon, Catherine de Ferrer, and Rochelle Olsen over in Australia for all of your support. I really do appreciate it. Having your monthly financial contribution coming in every single month makes a massive difference to help me produce this incredible content. Today, I'm delighted we're going to be speaking to Jackie Ferno, who spent seven years traveling the world on a motorbike. My name is Jackie Ferno, and I am now 68. I've had a, a lovely family. I've got two daughters that live in England. Uh, I'm currently in Tasmania in Australia, which is another example of my going with the flow. And when I was 48, I took myself off on a backpacking um, year because my marriage had fallen to bits. I'd had a very happy marriage. Uh, for 20 years and had two um, lovely daughters, Claire and Abby. Um, And somehow my marriage fell to bits when my husband got a new job, which took him away from the house quite a bit. And um, so I'm I'm afraid I found somebody else to play with. And that was the end of my marriage. And then that didn't work out either. So I went backpacking for a year just to get away from uh, everybody and to give them a break from me. And I felt very bad about everything that had happened. Um, But I did discover that whilst I was backpacking, I really liked this traveling lark. Uh, Met some fantastic people that I wouldn't have met otherwise. One of which, one of whom I should say, was um, a Dutchman who in in the book I call Hendrikus. And we stayed together for four days in Rajasthan in the desert of India And he was riding a motorcycle around the world. And I just happened to meet him in a restaurant one day. And that meal changed my life. And um, it it turned out that when I finished my backpacking year and went back home, uh, he caught up with me sometime later and invited me to join him by buying my own motorcycle and uh, traveling around the world with him for a little while. And I thought, well, this won't last. He was 17 years younger than me, and he looked a bit like Robert Redford and was um, an ex-lifeguard. And I thought, well, I'd be silly not to uh, take up this invitation. So dropped everything again and went off to India, bought myself an Enfield motorcycle like his. And we traveled around together for four years before he decided to settle in Australia. And, And I thought, well, that's the end. I can't carry on on my own. But I did, and for another three years before I was um, before I went back to the UK with the bike, which I'd never intended to do. But I sort of bonded with it after <laughs> about six months and couldn't uh, couldn't leave it behind. And I've still got it. I've brought it back to Australia again for its second trip to Australia because I really like it here. Oh, fantastic. Well, do you know what? There's so much stuff in there that we're going to be talking about. But let, let's go back to your first gap year then. So 48, the marriage is broken down. You decided to go to go back backpacking to take this year off. What was the reaction of your friends and family at this point? Because Was this in character for you, out of character? Well, it was, it was a bit out of character, really. Um... People were very worried and concerned for my safety and uh, the people I was working with. I was a health visitor in Stoke-on-Trent in the UK at the time. And lots of people said, well, you know, what What about your pension? And and where are you going to sleep? And, and do you book your hotels in advance? And I was thinking, I don't know the answer to any of these questions. I'll find out when I get there. So, yes, people were more concerned for me than I was for myself. And I just booked my flight and got the necessary visas for Thailand. 
um, having walked into the Manchester branch of Trail Finders, and I went in one day, uh, I plucked up the courage to actually leave the man that I had left my husband for. It wasn't working out. It was not a good relationship at all. And I, uh, I shut the door behind me and I said to the uh, assistant, um, please don't let me out of here until I've booked somewhere. I need to get away. So this wonderful uh, wonderful uh, uh, cashier. What would you call the somebody that behind the well, uh, travel advi- advisor? advisor. Yeah, the, the travel advisor. I really wish I could get in touch with her and say a big thank you to her because she said, "Look, I'm not letting you go until you've booked at least your first three nights in a in somewhere in Bangkok." Because we decided it would be best if I flew to Bangkok to start with and go from there because lots of backpackers start from Bangkok. And so that's what I did. I booked in for three nights and uh, and then uh, cried for the first three days and then decided, OK, well, here I am. I'm going to make the best of it. And so started uh, looking around, changed my hotel to a backpackers hostel, met a Swiss girl uh, called Christine and uh, We've been friends ever since. And uh, so, yes, we were off. That was it. I was OK after that. Did you have a plan for your for the whole year, as in the countries that you wanted to visit? Or did you know it was going to be 12 months and that you were going to travel, say, from like Thailand to Malaysia, Singapore, then Australia? Did you have a route or was it just you just got your first flight booked and your first three days in a hotel booked? Well, Abigail, that was the, um, the trip advisor, said... Um, Why not? Because I went into trail finders with absolutely no idea. All I knew was that I had to go to Pakistan at some stage because I was a health visitor and I had persuaded my manager to let me have a career break for five years, which probably isn't possible now. It was unpaid. But so if it all went wrong, I could come back and I'd still have a job. And so um, Abigail said to me, let's see, uh, start in Thailand, then you can fly to Karachi from Singapore, and then you can fly home from Mumbai after a year, and you can change the flight times, you can rearrange things as you like, but as long as you've got those four things in place, you can get around, and you could come home after two weeks if you like, uh, (laughs) as long as you get yourself to Bombay. So I thought, okay, I had that safety net and um, I was able to just relax. And in the end, I did go to, uh, I did follow that route and I went down to Singapore and then flew to Karachi, which was most interesting for me because as a health visitor in Stoke-on-Trent, a lot of my clients had a background from Pakistan and I wanted to see where they lived as well to see why they came to the UK. And uh, so that was interesting. Had a wonderful time and then crossed over into India. And uh, after a year, almost of the day, because I was enjoying it, flew home <laughs> to Manchester. Yeah. I, mean, I just want to take you back a little bit because you said, you know, you're, you're 48 years old. Uh, when you told people, people, you know, well, where are you going to sleep? They were concerned about your safety. What about your pension? Did you? I mean, it's, it's happened to me and, and we mentioned this earlier as well. Were you ever called brave or how did you feel? Did you feel brave at that point? Um, the only time I was really, really worried was on the plane going. And I thought, what am I doing? I have never, I'd never been on my own before. I'd always been somebody's daughter, sister, wife, mother. Uh, I'd never been just me. This was the first time I'd ever done anything like this. And I was frankly terrified on the plane But as soon as I landed, oh, I did have a lot to drink on the plane. So when I landed, um, I thought, well, okay, I've got to get myself from the airport to this hotel that uh, Abigail had insisted I book. Um, And so I did that and I just got a taxi. I did. I had a lonely planet with me and I knew there were buses that I could get. But it was so strange for me. So I, I shared a taxi, actually, with some people I'd met on the plane or in the queue to have your passport stamped and what have you and uh, so they made sure I got to the hotel and as I say I just stayed there for three days crying and then picked myself up and 
and got on with things and things improved greatly. So, yes, people have said to me, oh, you are brave. And but I didn't feel brave at all after that. It was just like being Alice in Wonderland. And the the bravest thing I think I've ever did was come home. I mean, you, you had those first three days, very emotional, massive cultural shock. You're suddenly alone. There's no more expectations. No one knows you. You've got this unlimited freedom mm. um, you know, to, to travel, to explore um, not only the places that you're at, but also to find out more about you when you're not pressurized by the pressures of society and you know the expectations of being a mother, being a wife, being a sister, being a daughter, etc. Talk us through what it was like those as your confidence built and, and the experiences that you had um, as you as you traveled. Well, yes, you're absolutely right. I I didn't know who I was because I'd been um, fulfilling the expectations of society as a nurse, as a mother, a wife, uh, supporting my husband in his job mostly and fitting in around everyone else, as most other women do or did at that time. Uh, and my life was sort of put on hold. And then all of a sudden, marriage is at an end. Children have gone off to university, well, finished university. And um, and I'm left with me. And, oh, <laughs> who am I? And so that first year, I, I had to sort of rediscover myself in, in, in the midst of being very sorry about my marriage finishing. I, I was a happy wife and mother and I, I was quite bereft so I had I had lots of things to cope with during that year and but gradually gradually I realized oh yes this this is me and I, I don't have to do things by the clock anymore because my ex-husband was very much a oh let's hurry on through this museum and then we can get on to the other place and the next place and and we all will only stay a day here and then we can go on to the next place. It was always rushing. And I realized um, when I got to Bangkok, I had something like three months on my Thai visa um, and I could just stay in the same place if I wanted to. And that was just lovely um, not to have to rush around and see everything. I had time and I realized that not everybody has got all the time that I had, most people can't afford to retire at 48, which is in effect what I did. Um, and, and so I had all this freedom. I didn't quite know what to do with it all. And uh, a, a budget, I didn't know how long my my budget would last. So I was very frugal to start with, but I was quite used to that, having been um, a wife during the 70s and, you know, things were quite we weren't well off at all, um, so I was used to being careful with money, and uh, and made everything last. So yes, it was quite a learning curve finding out who Jackie Ferno was. And uh, I must admit, now after seven years on the motorbike as well, well more than that now, I I do know who I am, and I actually like that. And I if it, is it conceited of me to say I actually quite like myself. And OK, I do ridiculously silly things and make daft decisions and go wrong a lot. And I allow myself to go wrong a lot and don't beat myself up about it. And, oh, well, that's just me. I'll do better tomorrow. And, uh, yes, that's what I've learned. And I'm I'm a much more confident person than I was to start with. I don't think it's conceited at all to like yourself and actually I, <laughs> I think it would I'd take it a step further it's it's about loving yourself like I honestly it's taken me a really long time to be like I love myself and it's not mm. in an it's not in an arrogant way but it's just you know I look after myself I care for myself I know who I am I know what motivates me I know what inspires me and many people never get that chance they they're too busy mm. seeing how other people see them when they're trying to impress other people whereas actually no the only person it uh, sounds selfish that you need to be concerned with is you and being able to like yourself and to spend time alone and to to deal with you know go through I mean you talk about almost you know the grief the end of your marriage learning about who who you are as a person and actually realizing look I, I like myself like you know I, I'm not perfect but I, I like mm. myself 
yeah, and a pat on the back sometimes, um, you know, to to remind yourself that you're really doing quite well. Um, and I I failed my eleven plus and was condemned thereafter as some sort of failure that I didn't meet the grade. Um, and so I look at myself now and I think, well, I'm immensely happy with how things have turned out, and that's more important to me now than any sort of exam passes or wealth. I'm not a wealthy person, but um, I'm happy. And that, to me, is more important than anything else. And I'm healthy, thank goodness. Mm, well, I've, I've studied Buddhism quite a lot. And yes, you're, you're quite right about the loving yourself. You can't possibly give love to anybody unless you have that for yourself. But as women, as women in particular, and as, mother, as a mother and a nurse and a wife, I had to I was a people pleaser. I had to please everybody else before it was my turn. It was sort of like a duty. Uh, and when you've got kids, of course, you do have to look after them. And uh, so my needs were put on hold until I was 48. So you said as well, like coming home from that backpacking adventure this year out where you did have this chance to find out more about you, you said that was that was being brave coming home. What was it like finishing this, you know, this 12 months out, this freedom to go back to the UK? What happened when you got back to the UK? Well, I decided that I wouldn't go back to being a health visitor because I did visit my colleagues because I was very fond of everybody I worked with and went back to see everyone. And I walked into the office that I'd worked, that I'd been based at, and listened to the phone calls and, and everything everybody was making. And it was exactly the same. Nothing had changed during the year I'd been away. And I thought, I can't go back to this I can't because I had changed so much and I didn't really think I would be a, a, a good health visitor anymore because I wasn't the same person. So that was quite interesting. And so I decided that instead of staying in Stoke on Trent, I would go back to Bristol, which is where my family roots were. And I had a brother living nearby and my ancient mother lived in Bristol as well. So uh, I went back to Bristol and, uh, lived on a boat for a while and then uh, that was quite interesting as well so and then uh, then this Dutchman that I'd met in India whilst I was backpacking came and knocked on my mother's door he we hadn't exchanged email addresses email was quite new then and uh, he said well I've never been able to forget you would you like to come back to India by your own Enfield and travel with me <laughs> so I hadn't got traveling out of my system at all and so I leapt at the chance and that's what I did so what what was that like you know a incredible that sounds very romantic having you know the Dutchman as that uh, his, his, yeah. his name will be rocking up on the doorstep I mean obviously not good if you didn't want him to be there but great that you did want him to be there and inviting you to go and travel the world on a motorcycle how long between him coming and knocking on your door did it take before you were out in India traveling uh about four or five months because he needed to work to uh to get some money together to con to continue traveling he'd left his motorbike in south africa and come to england to get some money and to get me on board <laughs> and uh so yeah we lived we lived at my mum's actually in bristol uh whilst he was working and then we went he went back to south africa got his bike flew it over to or shipped it over to india met me and then uh, we we bought my bike and uh, we travelled together from there on. So why did you pick the 500cc Enfield Bullet motorcycle? Because he had one and he said, why don't you get one as well? And I'd always had Japanese bikes before, uh, which were very reliable and I was no mechanic at all. I just used to take my motorbike to a mechanic every spring and say, can you prepare this for, the, for summer riding, please? Uh, I, I'm ashamed to say I didn't even know you had to change the oil on a motorbike. Uh, or <laughs> So I just wanted to ride it. I didn't want to do any of that sort of malarkey. So it was a bit of a rude awakening when I got the Enfield and suddenly had to do oil changes and and replace cables and learn how to maintain it because 
it's it's a really old design motorbike um, from from the 1940s design. So there's nothing modern on it at all. It's a kickstart. It's got drum brakes. And um, I'm actually having quite a bit of trouble with it at the moment because it's 18 years old now. And uh, but the technology is the same as it was in the 40s and 50s. So, yeah, quite a lot of maintenance to do. In fact, as I speak, I've got a tube of exhaust glue in my hand because I've got to plug up a hole in the exhaust pipe. Oh, dear. And uh, the headlight doesn't work, but that's uh, that's another matter. But, yes, I'm le- I'm, I've am I'm learned quite a lot about motorcycle maintenance. So what was it like? So obviously you, you travelled by yourself for a year, got to know yourself, and then the next adventure that you went on, riding on the motorcycle, starting in, starting in India, you're now riding with, with a partner. Um, mm-hmm. um, how did that change the travel? And what was it like being being in India and being on the motorcycle and, and going on this adventure? <gasps> oh, it was wonderful. It was absolutely marvellous. I loved it because Hendrikas was fun loving and adventurous and he'd say oh let's go up this road and it would be a dirt track and we didn't know where it would be going so we'd end up ending up in these tiny weeny villages where they'd probably never seen two people arriving on motorbikes two europeans one of which is a a big dutchman with orange hair and and a little because i'm only five foot two a little english woman on a motorbike they must have wondered what on earth was going on so yeah we we explored the countryside we went on little country roads it was lovely we avoided large cities and you know, we ate what everybody else was eating and we drank what everybody else was drinking. We ate street food. We lived on the cheap. We stayed in the cheapest hotels because Enriquez didn't have much in the way of funds and I didn't know how my money was going to stretch out. And, uh, yeah, so we, re- we really lived on the cheap, cheek by jowl with everyone else. Even slept on a pavement in Calcutta once. <laughs> what sort of budget were you, were you on? Um, minimal, absolutely minimal. I said, oh, if I had to work out how much we spent a day, oh, I don't think I could. I've never done that, actually. But if I give you an indication of the prices of the hotels we were staying at, they'd be something like 50 pence a night. So they weren't up to much. And one of the ones that we stayed in, we had a river running through the room every time it rained. Um, Oh, we'd stay in the cheapest possible scummy hotels. And we loved it. It was all we needed was a bed and a floor and we, we'd be happy and we'd eat out. I didn't have to cook. It was marvellous. <laughs> no cooking. Of course, now I hate cooking because I've uh, so many years on the road where I have just eaten street food or fruit and vegetables and things. Now I, I really dislike cooking and I'm most unenthusiastic about it. So yes, that it, that wasn't one of the negative things about travelling was that I just I stopped liking cooking. Not that I'd ever really been a good cook, as my daughters will tell you. But um, well, when you've got to, you've got to. But I didn't have to, and that was wonderful. So yeah, I I the first the first um, oh I don't know year or so uh, was fantastic travelling with Hendrikas because he was so much fun. And he'd always want to do something different. Oh, let's have a picnic. And we'd buy stuff and just sit at the side of the road. And Or other times we'd go into a posh restaurant and have something nice. It was vari- lots of variety. I do love variety. So from India, where did you go first or where did you head to? Um, well, we went uh, from India, we went into Nepal. And from Nepal into back into India and then into Pakistan. Uh, we spent a long time in India and Pakistan. Um, I broke my leg in Pakistan, which is why we spent such a long time there. Uh, we were going along. It was getting late in the year and we wanted to get from one side of northern Pakistan to the other side uh, before the snows came. So we were on this uh, road way up in the mountains. There's the Hindu Kush and the Karakorams where they meet. And... Suddenly, a four-wheel drive vehicle came around this track, and I had nowhere to go. There was river down to my right and mountain to my left, 
And there was absolutely nowhere to go, so I waited for the crunch. Oh. And crunch there was, one broken leg. But the people of Pakistan were absolutely amazing. They looked after the bikes whilst uh, whilst Hendrikas and I got a lift in the va- in the <laughs> In the truck that had rid- driven into me and broken my leg, they took us back the way we'd come uh, to the nearest health centre. And then from there, we uh, got uh, an ambulance and uh, returned to Gilgit, where we'd left a couple of days before. And then I was flown to Islamabad and had my leg put in a frame. And then somebody said, well, what are you going to do when you leave hospital? And I'd already decided not to go home. My mum was in her 90s. My daughters both had full-time jobs, and I thought, well, why don't I just stay here? So the insurance company paid for all my treatment in a private hospital, and Hendrikas was looking after me. And then when it came for me to be discharged, um, a family said, well, we'll look after you. And we'd met this family very briefly at a, at a silk festival up in Gilgit, and they said, if you're ever back in Islamabad, please come and uh, have a cup of tea. So Hendrikas had got hold of them, and they they came and, and fetched us and, and took me back to their place, and they were so kind, they even converted their squat toilet into a European one, especially for me, so I wouldn't have to do gymnastics to get down <laughs> off the loo. They were so kind, they wouldn't take a penny in payment. Oh. So, yeah. They're really, really nice. People of Pakistan are very good. And then Hendrikas went back to get the bikes one by one, and they had looked after them. They, they'd they done a bit of a repair job on mine uh, so that it could be ridden. And, yeah, it was wonderful. So I won't have anything said against anyone from Pakistan. Did you – was it difficult for you to get back on the bike after the crash? Um. No, I I couldn't ride my bike, um, even though I, I didn't have a plaster on my leg. I had a frame, a metal frame uh, called an external fixator. Uh, but I couldn't change gear with it on, otherwise I would have. But um, when it came off and it was time for me to get back on the bike, I was just a little bit wary for a while about doing left-hand bends, which is where the, um, the truck had driven into me having come round a bend but after a while I got back I got used to it and um that was fine no carried on as if nothing had happened which country stands out for you ah I'm often asked this um many many I went to about 20 uh, 20 countries on my way from India to Bristol uh India and Pakistan most definitely and australia which is why i've come back tell me more about australia what what happened when you what 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 is it about australia the vast open spaces i came in from east timor i put the boat the the bike on a boat uh, which i couldn't go on so i had to fly and i met it in darwin and um i just love the freedom of australia uh, the the space um, and the weather, it was absolutely lovely up in Northern Territory when I was up there and Queensland, loved it. I don't mind the hot and sticky t- uh, climates because I'd been in Asia for so long, hot and sticky was normal. And I'm in Tasmania at the moment, which is um, hot, but cool in the evenings. It's uh, very pleasant, but I, I don't dislike hot and sticky at all. So, but it's the wide open spaces, I think, and and the lovely people in Australia. They're so funny. So when you were traveling, you actually used to take um, boats um, between some islands and stuff. And I was reading in your book that about an, an experience you had with pirates. Would you like to share more about that? Oh, dear. <laughs> Usually when you have an experience when you're traveling, as you all know, you can look back on it and think, oh, that was funny. But... Do you know, those those two voyages where I was with um, skippers who didn't get on very well, I look back on those with horror. <laughs> but the one you're talking about in particular was um, going from, we were supposed to be going from Malaysia to Australia. 
and Henriquez and I had split up and I, w- I had thought that I would have to come home. And then I thought, oh, damn it, I'm going to try. And so I did, I carried on with the bike. And I met this sailor who said he was going from Malaysia to Australia through Indonesia. And I thought, oh, that would be lovely. So I established that he w- could take me, would take me, and that we would be completely business only. And uh, I would have my own cabin in this little 23-foot catamaran. And uh, yes, he said that would be fine. So I set to and helped him get the, get the catamaran ready. That took months and months and months. And all these red flags were waving at me and saying, no, don't go. So it, I, But I ignored them all and went anyway. And it turned out to be um, a quite, uh, <laughs> quite a full few weeks traveling with him. Uh, the, the, the tides were all wrong and the winds were wrong for the time of the year we went and we could hardly clear the Straits of Malacca because of the, the tides. And we picked up five Indonesian uh, castaways. They had been dumped uh, right in the middle of the Strait of Malacca between Indonesia and Malaysia. They had paid some Chinese fishermen to take them from one to the other illegally and they'd taken their money and then just dumped them and they'd been in the water for we we think two or three days and they would they had just been clinging to bits of polystyrene the odd uh, jerry can and bits of wood and, and they would surely have died so we picked them up intending fully to hand them in to the malaysian police, the authorities, when we got there. We had to divert our plan and go back to Malaysia, where, um, well, a bit further up the coast, uh, to hand them in for safety. Um, but we got rather fond of them um, on the on the trip over, so we, we sort of let them go. And uh, uh, right under the noses of the police, as it turned out, because where we had dropped anchor was right next to some police launches when they could if they just looked out they would have seen five indonesian men with uh, a few uh, possessions above their heads walking onto the beach but uh, luckily we all got away with it um yes um and then we set off again back onto our our plan to go through indonesia and one day some a, a fishing boat zoomed up to us because they've got big, powerful engines, and they came from nowhere. And um, Marcel, the skipper, said to me, "Quick, go down, get out of sight." So I did, and and they robbed us. Luckily, he kept them from coming on board, uh, but they demanded food and uh, money and uh, mostly food. Um, yeah, that's all we had left because we'd already been robbed on an, an Indonesian island that we'd set set down at wrongly, and we'd go, we'd gone to check in uh, our passports and, uh, and announce our arrival in Indonesia. And when we got back to the boat, somebody very has, very small had climbed in through one of the portholes and stolen oh no end of stuff. So we were already depleted. And uh, then we were robbed some more. So things didn't go terribly well on that voyage. How did you maintain your positivity? Or did you not? Or was it just, yeah, how did you handle this? Oh, well, keeping the skipper at bay was was one of the worst things because he had amorous ideas that I didn't. And um, so that, that was my biggest worry. Uh, and then there were storms, a lot of storms in between the, the the two land masses and that I was frightened then and I did think oh I'm going to die out here and then when I didn't and and all and, and I thought well gosh whatever next is going to happen I just thought well if my time is up my time is up I didn't really want to drown but I thought well I don't know and by that time I had read a lot uh, of about Buddhism and just taking what comes and bending like a blade of grass. And I had learned to just take what comes and cope with 
things as they happen and not worry about the future or the past. And so I just concentrated on surviving minute by minute and uh, it seemed to stand me in good stead. I'm surprised you <laughs> would, would did you did you go sailing again after this ex, after this experience of dealing with castaways and pirates and amorous captains? Yeah, you'd have thought I'd have learnt my lesson, wouldn't you? But no, <laughs> I went and did exactly the same thing again when I got to Colombia and I had to leave Colombia. And the only way to get to Panama. Uh, you you can go through the Darien Gap, but it's extremely dangerous and and extremely difficult to do so. People have, but it's quite rare. And I thought, well, I'm not putting my family through even attempting that. And I know I wouldn't have made it because the Enfield's a heavy bike and I couldn't have done it on my own. The people that have gone have usually gone in teams. So that was out of the question. So I could have flown with the bike from Bogota to... Um, Panama City or the other option is to sail round and there are sailors who will for a certain amount of money uh, take you and your motorcycle or bicycle or passengers or whatever uh, for quite a lot of dollars and so I thought well this is my only option so I waited and waited and waited in Cartagena and put notices up at the yacht club and the marina um, asking if anyone would like to take me and eventually, um, I was in, put in touch with Antonio. So, yes, I was stuck in Cartagena for quite a long time, waiting for somebody to uh, answer one of my advertisements uh, in the marina. Um, and eventually, um, an Italian answered and said he would take me and the bike for a, a certain amount of dollars. I can't remember whether it was a couple of hundred dollars, I think. But he he um, had a very bad reputation and no end of people said, oh, don't go with him. He's dangerous. He's been in prison for people smuggling. He hit his daughter publicly in a restaurant and he, he don't. He's dangerous. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's incompetent. But no, the same thing happened again. I spent months helping him get the boat ready. And it was a business only arrangement. And uh, off we went. And it was a catalogue of disasters, the same as the other one had been. So, but um, but I survived that one as well. <laughs> and, uh, but I did swear to the bike. I promised it I would never, ever put it on a small boat ever again. It's been on various ferries. and uh, But no, not no more small boats. So, but then, um, this is another story. I then got into a relationship with another sailor. Um, but that's another story. And that was probably worse than anything. However, I was going to say, tell us that go. story. But when you said it was worse than anything, I thought, oh, maybe we don't want to hear that story. <laughs> no, you don't. No, it was nothing to do with the bike on, on this occasion. It was just a relationship I had with somebody who, uh, who lived on a boat. So I think now, after three times, I have learned my lesson and I will avoid sailors, boats and everything from now on. Fair enough, fair enough. Seven years is a long time to be on the, on the road, a long time to be travelling. Did you ever get tired of it? Did you ever want to stop or ever want to go back to having a more normal life or, or back to the routine, back to the UK, back to your mum, back to your daughters? Well, yes. Even travelling becomes aimless and boring sometimes. And it, it did become quite tedious I'd stay in a place I'd have a look around get on the bike go to the next place have a look around find somewhere to stay have something to eat maintain the bike and go on to the next place and it was fascinating looking at all the places that I was looking at but I did wonder what on earth I was doing it all for And then I thought, well, what would I do if I wasn't doing this? Because I was traveling in cheap countries at a time when the pound was pretty strong, the British pound. And uh, so I could afford to live very cheaply in places like uh, Asia and South America, Central America. Um, And I thought, well, I haven't got a home because I, I, I didn't have anywhere to live in the UK And as I say, my mother was ancient. By this time, she was in residential care. 
So I couldn't even go back home and look after her. Um, my daughters had their own lives going. They wouldn't want their mother suddenly turning up and saying, hi, I'm back. <laughs> so uh, I had to, I thought, well, and, and I still had that guilt that I'd been traveling around with me. Um, I'd, I'd had it with me. Oh, I messed up my marriage. Oh, my kid, my children will never forgive me. I, I, there was always this, hmm, it was like, an overcast day when it's sunny and, and there's a cloud in the distance. It was it was a bit like that. I always had this, oh, but I messed up. They won't really want me at home. And then I don't want to spoil the, the story f for everyone, but there was a reason why I didn't think like that anymore when Abby came to visit me in Ecuador. And that's when I started to make my way home after six years. <laughs> and I got home after seven and it was hard how did you adjust back to normal life did you I mean because you've you've written a book hit the road jack is that when you started writing the book no it took me another seven years before I could even settle down enough to do that it it did hit me hard going home it was after the initial, hi, I'm back, and oh, tell us all about your travels, and people start yawning as soon as you say, when I was in such and such a country, and they go, oh, yeah, because people can't comprehend what it's like being away for so long, because I was very lucky. Most people have two or three weeks holiday a year um, at one stretch to go and have a holiday, and, and to be away for seven years is is beyond most people's comprehension. So to try and explain is is very difficult. I expect you found the same. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah, people glaze over after a while and I thought, oh, all right, well I'll shut up then. And so I did. I wrote a few magazine articles, but I I it did take me such a long time to well I haven't settled down clearly because I'm back again. <laughs> I'm back again traveling with the bike in Australia. And uh but no, writing the book, it, it took me seven years and I w I'd been doing lots of talks. And at the end of the talks, people would say, oh, you please write a book, please write a book. And I thought, well, they're just being kind. And I did um, I did magazine articles and those went down very well. And people always accepted everything I wrote. And then one day um, I, I was writing articles for uh, a very good magazine called um, Overland Magazine. And I said to the editor one day, I said, what do you think about me writing a book? And he said, yep, do it. I'll um, I'll do it under my publishing company and help you all I can. And that was Paddy Tyson of Overland Magazine run by um, himself. He started it with Nick Brown, who I happen to be traveling with at the moment in Tasmania. He's on a round the world trip and I've sort of jumped in on his trip for a few months uh, or however long it goes on for and um, so I did I thought okay I'm gonna do this and I still didn't think I had settled down enough so I did an A level in history to see if I could make myself sit down and do something and I, I did that and uh, I passed that so I thought well maybe I can write a book then and so I started and my daughters, I must say, gave me the most amazing support. And I wrote it partly for them because uh, I thought, no, I want you to know what I did and where I've been and who I met and how I felt. And they were very, very helpful. And, and there were times when I thought, oh, this is rubbish what I'm writing. And Abby would say, no, mum, it's good. Keep going. Keep going. And it would Claire, that my elder daughter, would say, mum, you've got to put more of yourself in this book. People don't want to read just what it's like in this place, that place and the other place. It's like a it's neither a travel book or a guide book or nothing. You've got to put more of yourself in. And so I'm afraid I emptied myself into the book somewhat. But um, and that's what uh, that's what it's turned out like. But there it is. It seems to be going quite well. People cough, uh, often get in touch with me to say they've enjoyed it. So that's good. That's fantastic. And when did the book get published? October 2017. Fantastic. I mean, that must have that must have been another real milestone in your journey. 
Um, you know, it was. It was. Um, and it's taken on a life of its own, um, which is fantastic. It's it's the next part of the journey, actually, because people hear about it, they buy it, and they invite me to go and talk to their motorcycle clubs or their women's institute group or all sorts of groups have said, oh, can you come and talk to us? And, of course, usually they want me to bring the bike, so I, I ride my bike to wherever I'm doing the talk if I can. And, uh, yeah, so the the book's taken on a life of its own. It's quite funny, really. <laughs> I'm quite enjoying it. So tell, me, tell us more about your plans for 2019 then. Where, where's next for you? Uh, no idea. I don't make plans. My talk is actually called Plan What Plan? How, <laughs> how to have fun whilst going with the flow. Uh, well, I'm here at the moment with Nick and we're dog sitting and house sitting for a couple we met through the bikes. Um, the, the owner is um, of the house is president of the Royal Enfield Owners Club of Australia. And they've helped me out considerably because the bike has been nothing but trouble ever since it arrived in Australia. And without p other people's help, um, it would have cost me a fortune. I'd probably have had to have gone home. So it's only right that we're looking after somebody's dog whilst um, she's in hospital and uh, so they've had to fly to Sydney so we're looking after Pippin their little black dog and uh, making sure that the house is all right and uh, yeah so we're here for a week and it's just lovely thoroughly enjoying it it's on it's in Exeter by a river and it's a beautiful spot to be so Jackie, I was going to say, so your talk is called plan, you know, what, what plan? And, um, and I think sometimes people can, people can either be planners or not planners and there's no right or wrong way about doing it. I definitely, I'm more of a planner. I like planning and I, I like being organized. I like knowing what I'm doing, but equally at the same time, I sometimes do try and just be relaxed and it's like, be relaxed there, relax, just go with the flow. <laughs> But, yes. but for people who are serial planners or who don't want to go on an adventure or go traveling until they've planned every last detail out, what advice would you have for going with the flow? Well, they've got to want to go with the flow. Um, there is a technique to it. Uh, you, you sort of have a vague plan on where you'd like to go because ob obviously I decided at some stage that I would like to join Nick when he got to Australia, if he would, if he didn't mind, and he didn't. So um, obviously, I had to plan all that, booking myself on a flight, getting the bike organized to be uh, shipped over. That took a lot of planning and organization. But once here, um, I just wanted to see Tasmania. And so we got on a ferry. And of course, with my name being Ferno, there's a group of islands in between mainland Australia and Tasmania called the Ferno Group of Islands, named um, after Tobias Ferno, who first um, identified them and put them on the map. Um, so I had to come and go to one of the, the Ferno Islands. So we went to Flinders Island for a week, and that was fun. But as from now, uh, I have absolutely no plans. And people keep saying, oh, where are you going to go after here? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, we're just going to tootle around and see what happens. But we keep getting invited to places be through very kind people who hear about us um, from the Enfield Club. And um, so who knows, we might be doing some more house sitting or dog sitting or talks here and there. We're doing we're going to a pub tonight to to do a bit of a talk, I think, uh, if that's how it works out. So, yeah. I'll wait and see what happens. Wait and um, see what as, happens. For, as for advising anyone else, I wouldn't know where to start. It's just so refreshing not to have to plan because as a nurse and a mother and a, and a wife and, and having a job as, as well as juggling everything else, taking children to piano lessons and ballet lessons and heaven knows what, you have to be organised and plan. Um, but it's so nice to, to not have to when you don't have to. I hear you. I hear you. And Jackie, where mm. can people find more information out about you and um, and your book and, and your adventures that you've been on? Um, well, I've got a website that my daughter put together for me and it's www.jackieferno.com. And I'm on Facebook as Jackie Ferno Travels. Um, what else is? Oh, I'm on Instagram 
um, which is at Jackie Ferno. And I'm on Twitter, but I don't use it very often. And that's I'm Bullet Jack. Um, that's about it, really. Um, and the book's available. The book is called Hit the Road, Jack, and it's uh, a hard copy. It's also on Kindle. And I've just released it as an audio book read by me. Fantastic. Well, <laughs> That was brilliant. And, and thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast to share more about your life, the journeys that you've been on, um, telling us more about the, the book, the challenges that you face. Absolutely inspiring. Lots of advice and top tips in there. Um, but yeah, just best of luck with wherever you end up next, whatever you end up doing. I'm sure it will all work out. It will. There'll be challenges. There always are. But we'll cope with those as they turn up. Hey Tribe, I hope you enjoyed that episode with Jackie. What an absolute inspiration. So whether you plan or don't plan, it's not even about that. The it's just about taking action and going after your dreams, going after your goals, whatever they may be. Now, all of the information that we've talked about is available at toughgirlchallenges.com. On the website, you'll find all of the previous guests that I've interviewed. So there's over 190 episodes now. We've got women from all walks of life, all backgrounds, all ages, all doing a whole variety of different challenges. So please do go check out the website for more information, toughgirlchallenges.com. If you're new to the podcast and you've never heard it before and you think, who is this podcast? Who is this woman? talking to me now you can find more information out about me my background what I've done such as through hiking the Appalachian Trail riding a bike from Vancouver in Canada all the way down the Pacific Coast Highway and down Baja California to Mexico I am currently in Melbourne at the moment but only for the next couple of days or so so at the beginning of March I'm going to be flying off to India where I'm going to be doing a yoga retreat I'm basically going to be eating vegetarian and vegan food for a month I'm going to be doing about 200 hours of yoga and the plan is to become a qualified yoga instructor. Instructor, I'm also going to be giving my body and my mind a break. So I'll be coming off social media for that whole month. And I hopefully the yoga will just sort out my lazy glutes and everything else that seems to be going wrong with my body at the moment. So a total refresh for me, sort out the body, sort out the mind. The Tough Girl podcast will still be coming out every Tuesday at 7am UK time. There's also going to be a special bonus episode which comes out on the 8th of March, which is International Women's Day. So make sure that you have subscribed so you don't miss out. We'll we're going to be speaking to Isabel Best, who wrote an incredible book called Queens of Pain, which is all about the female cyclist from a notable female cyclist from history. So loads of great stories. It's going to be a really, really interesting episode to listen to. Now, I am trying to put more episodes out this year via Tough Girl Extra, but I can only do this if I continue to receive financial support from the patrons, from you, from the listener. So whether you listen to this episode regularly or whether you binge listen, if you are getting value from it, please consider giving back signing up as a patron sign up at two dollars a month five dollars a month ten dollars a month um the more patrons the more income i have coming in really does make a massive difference to what i can do in this space and i have such big dreams and such big ambitions and i really want to to take tough girl challenges to the next level which um which with your help, I can hopefully do. So please do go check out www.patreon.com forward slash tough girl podcast. And uh, yes, yeah, sign up and become a patron. As always, if you've got any feedback, anything you want to let me know, then please do get in contact with me. Sarah at toughgirlchallenges.com is my email. I normally am on Instagram at toughgirlchallenges. It's probably best to send me a DM. I do try and respond to everybody as quickly as I can. But for March, please bear with me because I will be taking this break from social media anyway thank you so much for listening thank you so much for giving up your time i really appreciate it whether you are pottering in the house whether you're going for a run whether you are at the gym sat on a bike or whatever it is that you're doing commuting into work just have an incredible day follow your dreams give give everything that you've got give 110 percent because the more you give the more you're going to get back in return so yeah sending you lots of love and i'll speak to you soon all right take care bye <laughs>